Good evening, man. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for coming online to watch and be part of this online men's night. I'm so glad that you're able uh, to join me uh, this evening as president of the association. You know, I've just been hearing over the last number of months, number of challenges that we men have been facing in this pandemic. And Baptist women have done a great job in encouraging, supporting and helping the women through so much uh, over the last few months, but there's been nothing for men. So just thought we'd put this little time together. Hopefully it'll be a time of encouragement for us, a time of blessing for us, maybe just a little time of reflection. So got a little bit of a, a, a busy program coming up. Everything's going to move quite quickly this evening. We know that we don't want to let it drag. I want to honour your time. I thank you so much for your time. But the whole point of this is that we will emerge from this better man, that we'll be better able to lead our families, better able to lead our churches, and uh, better able to, to be the kind of godly man that God wants us to be. And I, for me personally, I want to be better. Uh, I'm sure that we all want to be better men as we go forward into the future. So thank you for joining us online. Um, I hope you find this little time useful for us. I'm sure that you will. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then there's going to be a worship song comes onto the screen. I really want you to just rejoice in that, to worship uh, with that. Uh, just where you are, just try to shut out distractions. Uh, just try to focus on the moment uh, on worshiping our King and worshiping our Savior. And then we're going to hear from a couple of, of men right away. And the first one we're going to hear from is uh, a guy called Johnny Ward. He's just recorded something for us. Then I'm going to jump in and do a live interview with somebody. And then you'll hear another little pre-record after that. So uh, in a moment, I want to encourage you to worship with us uh, wherever you are, man, uh, at home, wherever you may be watching this, and that you'll be blessed tonight as the Lord draws near to you. But let me just pray for us as we start. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be here this evening. I thank you for all the men watching on YouTube right now. Father God, thank you for them. Thank you for their lives. Thank you for their souls. And we pray, Lord, that the time that we spend together this evening might just really bless our hearts and encourage us together and challenge us together to be men of God in this generation. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi guys, my name is Johnny Ward. Uh, I have a wife and four young boys uh, under the age of eight. So as you can imagine, my house is a bit crazy. Um, Trev's asked me just to speak on the last seven months roughly with lockdown. And um, certainly on reflection, it's been a bit of a crazy time for me. Uh, we run our business with my wife and, you know, literally as soon as it happened, we had to close it all down like most people. For us, it was a very stressful time not sure what was going to happen literally had to run through finances etc but in a time as crisis it was also an amazing time for us uh, we came to a crossroads and uh, i know i could have either ran towards god or ran away and i praise god i, I ran to him and literally clinging on to him every day um and i really feel it's brought me closer to him um my nickname in, in work is the whirlwind and anybody that knows me, I'm a bit of a hundred mile an hour type of guy. Um, I, I used to work stupid hours. I would put everything into anything, including work, church stuff, anything. And as much as that can be a blessing for me, massive lessons were learned over lockdown. Not only, and this is what God normally does with me, he literally puts my back to a wall or and uh, knocks me into a corner, so I have to rely on him. Um, and not only with lockdown, I then had a, a little fight with a, a chainsaw and the chainsaw won. So I was off my feet for a good three, four months. And I mean, literally off my feet. Um, and that was an amazing time, time of learning a lot um, from being so frustrated and impatient, etc. But also a, a real blessing where I got to rely on God and, and spend some quality time with him and, and just take time apart. Um, of lots of different uh, resources and stuff that I was going through, but um, a couple of different things uh, or books that I was obviously going through was the classic, obviously Philippians, we were doing that with our church as well, which was fantastic. Um, Corinthians went through that. Um, the Psalms actually... I really um, enjoy going through the Psalms. Um, Psalm 146 is an amazing chapter to me. really spoke out about bowing down before God himself and how mighty a God he is. Um, and uh, I went through a few books as well. Um, but it was interesting. I know it was Francis Chan that would sp speak about how uh, this is the time to reset. And, and if, if you don't change from lockdown, there's something wrong here. And for me, it was an amazing opportunity to just stop reset and focus on god and there are a lot of different we go mo mo movements and uh, and times that happened that obviously i can't go through now with only this short period of time but it really made me reset where where i am in my life my work-life balance has completely radically changed um, i'm focusing a lot more time on my family which is our first mission field um i'm enjoying just the stillness with god and even going and meditating and stuff, which is stuff I never would have had time for. I would have asked somebody, oh, give me a quick synopsis. What's this? What's that? I, I'll do it then. I'll move on. Whereas now I'm like, no, this is this is an important time. I believe it's a time for, for men to stand up as well. And it's been really encouraging for me to have uh, brothers in Christ that I can really um, grapple with um, of what this true Christianity and relationship with God is. Um, one of uh, a fantastic verse in James 5, 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And that was powerful with being able to speak truth into other guys' lives and for them to speak that into me. So it's been a real blessing that. Um, as well as actually my son, his favorite verse is Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Um, and those are two wee small gems I just wanted to share with you guys. But what an amazing opportunity that this is. This is a time that we can still speak truth out there in, in this society, um, as well as really reflect and look in our own lives and, and where we are. And I know I'm still on a journey, um, but I'm certainly excited to see where God's going to bring me. Thanks.
Thank you, Johnny. That was uh, that was Johnny Ward there from Newton Breed of Baptist start a Church, my own church. And I've got a uh, Aaron Davis with me now. Hi, Aaron. You just want to unmute yourself there, Aaron. Uh, this is Aaron. Aaron is uh, Aaron. Just want to introduce yourself to us. Tell us what church you're from. Yes, thanks, Trevor. Um, yes, my name is Aaron Davis, and I go to Hamilton Road Baptist, which is based in Bangor. Okay, and tell us, uh, Aaron, what you do for a living. Uh, I am a secondary, well, a special needs teacher now, uh, qualified to teach um, technology and design. Uh, so that's what I do. I teach in a special school uh, and I deliver technology and design to uh, a wide mixture of age and abilities and love it. It's brilliant. Great. Just tell us a little bit about your old lockdown experience, Aaron. I know that there was particular challenges for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, obviously lockdown for many of us um, in some ways came uh, as a bit of a shock to us. Um, maybe we heard rumours and rumblings of things, but when that um, that Monday came and we were suddenly in lockdown, it was like, oh, right, okay. Um, and from a school perspective, um, it was very strange because um, yeah, um, we were suddenly thrust into online learning and trying to um, keep our young people engaged that way. So, um, but just listen there to Johnny um, on his reflection of lockdown as well. I suppose in some ways um, I was quite grateful for the time because, again, similar to what Johnny was saying, I have very much and still to this point battling with living life at 100 mile an hour trying to do a million things at once um so that time of just literally stopping and reflecting and just um resting and relying on the lord was just so beneficial and so um helpful because um i think i just needed a wee uh, time to just uh, reflect on what god was teaching uh, wanted to teach us uh, my wife and I, uh, we did go through a bit of a um, of a trial and circumstance where we experienced uh, great loss uh, in terms of starting our family and whatnot. But um, yeah, it was uh, a challenging time. But um, Psalm 130, um, I suppose, was uh, something that was personally really encouraging to me, especially verse 5 where it's just saying about waiting on the Lord. My soul was waiting, but yet having to remind myself that I, even though I'm waiting for the answer of why God was putting us through what we went through, but to remind us that we still have a hope, that there's a hope in God. And even though we don't understand maybe at that point what why we were having to go through that, that that hope is so real and to keep relying on that. And yeah, and that there has taught us, uh, both Rachel and I, uh, great lessons. And um, even, even the song uh, that is based then on Psalm 130, I will wait, on, I will wait for you, has been, become a huge um, particular favourite of mine, just even in the car in the mornings. I love morning times in the car. I don't listen to the radio very often at all. That's my time with God. And uh, that song in, in particular in the morning times has been very important. Um, so, yeah, grateful for lockdown in some ways just to recharge the batteries and refocus on God. Um, but also um, it was a time of just real, um, real lessons to be learned and to properly. We know we all say we're waiting on the Lord to tell us uh, and give us an answer. But that time where nothing else could really happen but be in your house. Um, it was so good just to really hear God's voice clearly. Great, Aaron. And you're involved in the men's ministry in Hamilton Road as well. Yes. Um, so I co-lead our lads, dads and granddads with another guy, Stuart, at Hamilton Road, uh, which is a huge opportunity and blessing uh, to be part of. Um, so we have been very busy over lockdown um, and we have a committee as well, which um, supports us. Um, to with our program that we do. So we have about 12 men on our committee and um, it's just great to have um, a good working relationship with each other. But many of us were going through different personal trials and battles um, and we would have been, we were producing material as the rest of us online. Everything had to go online. 
Um, so we found that we were meeting more regularly um, uh, for Zoom meetings and to keep planning our program. So we've had like um, quite a busy monthly program right up until now. We're just giving ordinary guys in the church uh, the opportunity to reflect on lessons that uh, God was teaching them. But what we also wanted to do, we're not very good at complimenting each other, men. We're, you know, we just sort of get on with it. So we um, were giving guys the chance to sort of pre-record a skill set that they might have had, whether it be a bit of woodwork or some very interesting cooks in the Hamilton Road. So um, just to, uh, yeah, just sort of learn things that got there. And that has been very well received, um, putting that out. But what we're trying to do is... Uh, change our focus now onto discipleship. Um, so we have in their last few months been focusing on uh, encouraging each other to sort of rely on each other, pray for each other and uh, support each other. So trying to host the likes of round table discussions and things like that. All socially distance, of course, as well, following the guidelines. Yeah. Aaron, thanks so much just for jumping in and sharing with us tonight. We really, really appreciate that. Here's another little reflection from John Gibson from the Letter Kenny Baptist Church. Hello, uh, my name is John Gibson. I live in Donegal with my wife Helen um, in Kilmacrennan, just outside Letterkenny. We came here 14 years ago from having lived oh, for 20 years in the Malayal Donegadee area. Uh, I lived in Donegal when I was younger, and during that time I met uh, Helen, who later became my wife of now 44 years. We have four grown-up children, Jennifer, who's married to Paul, Simon, who's married to Jane, Jill, who's married to Matt, and Ben, who's married to Tara. We have eight uh, grandchildren. The question before us here tonight is the pandemic and what it's been like living through the pandemic. Uh, it's not been easy. No one has found it easy. And one of the things that was a bit of a challenge to me uh, was living for weeks on end without a haircut and beginning to look uh, quite quite untidy. Um, my wife, uh, Helen, trimmed it for me a couple of times, but to be honest, I was glad to get back to uh, a barber's again and um, get the number three on the side and trimmed it on the top. Before COVID hit, and my goodness, didn't it spread quickly? When it was in China, I do remember thinking to myself, well, that's 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 too bad for them, but it's a long way away. And then suddenly it was in Spain and in the rest of Europe and then into Ireland and the United Kingdom. And it, and that has spread quickly and, and the numbers go up and down with such speed and such uh, amazing fluctuation. So it's been a very, very distressing situation for, for lots of people. We've had two bereavements in the family since COVID started. We've had uh, two funerals and two weeks that are not like anything else we've ever experienced. So lots of, lots of changes brought about. Some aspects of it were quite nice. The quietness during the first lockdown, the stillness was quiet, it was nice. But still, with all of that, there were people who were suffering really, uh, really badly. Before the pandemic hit, we were looking after my mother-in-law, who's 92. And then when the pandemic hit, Helen, my wife, had to go and stay with, stay with her. And that's, that's not been easy. Uh, the pandemic was kind of in, in, a, in a space outside of the house. And we were very careful about people coming and going and we kept it at bay. But recently it has come into the family. Uh, thankfully, thank, thank, thank God, no one has been uh, seriously uh, ill with it. But it has come over the door step, so, so to speak, not, in, not directly into our house, but certainly into, into close family, including a little infant who's had it, but is doing okay. The question here for us to consider really is, as Christians um, sur surviving the pandemic, and what sense do we make of it? And uh, in our own home here, we've had lots of discussions about that. And one of the discussions we had was thinking about God calling Abraham out of, out of the Chaldees. And he, and he followed, he left. He didn't know where he was going, but he followed. And that is still the case for us 
as men, as women, as believers, that we are called uh, to follow um, the world and its interpretation of the pandemic and what it all means can is a reality. We have to listen to it. We have to live with it. We have to do what keeps everybody safe. But it's a distraction from what really, in a sense, from what God is doing. And it is God who we have to have as our focus and, and his um, eternal plan. There have been difficult days through it, definitely difficult days. No, 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 no really dark days, as I would have called them from having experienced an episode of depression in the, in the past. I know what dark days are. It certainly have been difficult days. So how do you manage difficult days as a Christian? One of the places I go to is a very familiar psalm, Psalm 121. I to the hills will lift mine eyes. From whence, from where does my strength come from? My strength comes from the Lord. The act of looking up, of looking out to the horizon and looking upwards is a good thing to do for our mental health. But spiritually, the act of, of looking up and, and taking our gaze um, heavenward, vertically, and at the same time asking ourselves that question, where does my help come from? It doesn't come from the philosophies and the psychologies and all the other ologies of the world. It comes from God alone. That's where our help comes from. Thank you. Well, I just want to say a very big thank you to Johnny from Newton Breda, to Erin from Hamilton Road, and to John, whom you heard there last, from Letterkenny, just sharing some of their own experiences through lockdown. One of the reasons why we're gathering together this evening is because I do believe with all my heart that the world needs better men. Our families need better men and our churches need better men. It's really hard to be a man in the 21st century. We've all heard and read those stories of men who have become abusive, either in their leadership or in their in their families and we don't want to be those kind of men uh, we've also heard those stories of men who have just abdicated their responsibilities completely and not stepped up the leadership and we don't really want to be those kind of men either we want to be god's men uh, for the 21st century and as we're coming to the end of 2020 and into 2021 i'm sure it is your desire as it is my desire to be a real man of god in this generation Certainly I notice and you will notice in your churches that it is the ladies who often lead the way spiritually. So often the women are to the forefront of the Sunday school. Women are to the forefront of the kids clubs. Women are to the forefront when it comes to any kind of service. Now I know men, if, if, if you want a wall knocked down at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, there's some men who are there with their, with their kango hammers and all the rest of it. But sometimes when you look around the prayer meeting, it's not so much the men that are really carrying or doing the heavy lifting, it's the women. And we want to readdress that, don't we? We want to be the men that God wants us to be. I think we need to reflect on two great privileges. First of all, the great privilege of being saved. That's an amazing thing. Every morning as a man, you should wake up being excited that you're in the family of God, that you're adopted into God's family, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then secondly, the great privilege of service. Service is not an obligation. Service is not a responsibility. Service is a privilege. It is a privilege to serve our King of Kings. And so I want you to reflect on, on a couple of things. First of all, your time. Time is the most precious thing that we have and time is moving quickly and we are told in scripture to redeem the time or to to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil now we're we're living in a world actually where there are more demands on our time than ever yeah many of you will remember that if you, if you missed your favorite tv program you'd missed it if you missed the match at a certain time you'd missed it but now it's always there for you to watch back, to catch up on. And, and all of this stuff streams at us. 
and distracts us and diverts us from really using our time well and wisely for the kingdom of God. The second thing are our talents. Every one of us have, has certain gifts that we can use. They're given to us. First Corinthians and other scriptures remind us that we're given gifts for the for the common good, for the blessing and edification of, of others. And we remember the, the parable that Jesus told, how the reward was given to those who invested their talents, not those who had their talents. And man, I want to say to you, you've all good gifts, you've all good talents that your church needs, that our association needs. So do not waste them. Time, talents, and then thirdly, treasure. Money is a massive issue in the lives of men and the lives of our world uh, generally. And it is so important that you know how to handle your money. Your children are watching, your grandchildren are watching, that you need to be a generous giver and have a culture of generosity in your life and in your home. Because that's the kind of attitude and mindset that God loves to bless as men. So there's a couple of uh, disciplines around our time, around our talents, around our treasure that we might think through and how we can be absolutely the best that we can be for our King of Kings. Now, you may have heard of Kent Hughes, who wrote a, a wonderful book called The Disciplines of a Godly Man. It's a book that many people have used and it's been a blessing to many. And I was able to secure an interview with Kent just last week. He was to speak at our 125th anniversary service of our association. That didn't take place, but he very graciously gave me some of his time for an interview. Now, it's in two parts. The first part lasts about 15 minutes. Uh, immediately after that, you will see a couple of questions pop up on the screen. I just want you to just take two minutes where you sit. Do not be distracted, please. And just reflect on those questions coming out of the interview that Kent gave me. And then we'll carry on with a few other things in the programme this evening. So here's the interview with Kent Hughes. Okay, so uh, it's lovely to be with Kent Hughes tonight. Kent, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for joining us on our men's night tonight. Thank you for being willing and available to do this interview with us. You are in Spokane in Washington State. Is that right? That's right. Uh, all the way, almost up to Canada, not very far away. Okay. Well, look, it's, it, we're so grateful that you're giving us your time tonight. Author of Disciplines of a Godly Man. And I know that many of our pastors have used that book in different contexts, and it's been an incredible blessing to so many people. Just tell us how you came about the right disciplines of a godly man and how God has used that. Well, it goes back some decades now, as you know. And uh, I was pastoring College Church in Wheaton, Illinois, and um, I always did Lectio Continua. That's preaching consistently through books of the Bible. I never did any topical preaching. And my staff said to me, you ought to do some topical sermons. And I said, I don't do topical preaching. I just preach the Bible. And um, they, they stayed on me. And so finally I said, well, I'll think about it. And I went home and talked to my wife. And I said that this is what it wanted me to do. And that the disciplines were something that was really important to me. And I had a friend who said, do it if it's burning in your bones. If not burning in your bones, don't do it. So I said, I think I'd, I'd like to do a topical series on spiritual discipline. And my wife, uh, like a prophet, looked at me and said, don't do it for all of us. Just do it for men because men need it more than women. Yeah, yeah. Why, <laughs> do, you think, so, why do you think men need disciplines so much? Well, um, I mean, statistically, uh, more women go to church regularly than men. Uh, I mean, that's just a fact, at least that, that's a fact statistically in the States. It's been established over and over again. Um, they uh, read their Bibles more regularly than men, uh, read devotional books more than men. So just on that basis, you could say that. And then I think that a lot of women anecdotally say, I, I, I need spiritual leadership in the home. 
So the, those, those are the reasons my wife said that and said it with such uh, vehemence. And I think it was the voice of the Lord because yeah. what happened is that when I preached, I, I worked out at some, I just laid out a few disciplines and started preaching on them and preaching from a same sex perspective, men to men is much more uh, uh, direct, much more, you can be uh, straightforward with men. And so I did it. I preached it to the men on the Lord's Day with the women sitting next to them listening, so to speak. Right. Probably elbowing them and smiling, you know, as I gave it to the men. Yeah. Now, all the disciplines are transferable, but uh, it, it uh, actually uh, gave it that kind of pungency um, and directness that I think people know about the book. So that's how it happened. Yeah. And then, just, then just I... Yeah. Then I mentally put a picture of my sons, yeah. uh, who are now middle aged, but my sons in front of me, and, and fixed a coffee cup in my mind. And we're going to have a talk about things that are really important areas to be disciplined in as a man. And so I, I it t turned out to be like eighteen sermons to my church on the Lord's Day, and. Uh, uh, I did, had no idea that it was going to become a book. That wasn't the idea. But after it was done, I w was approached by Crossway Books. And uh, the rest is history. It's been yeah. out there and sold about half a million books now. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm really delighted you could speak to the men of our churches tonight because you were to come to Belfast to preach in our 125th celebration service, which in the providence of God and because of the pandemic didn't take place. but over the last seven months since lockdown, men have struggled, I think, in different areas. So what do you think are the threats to men becoming the godly man that they need to be? Well, um, the, I think the threats are that uh, one is, is that if you, if you imagine discipline, uh, in your mind, and it transmutes to legalism, as it often does. Person hear, hears discipline, they think about the rigors of discipline, it automatically moves over to legalism. It's a huge mistake, because discipline and legalism are universes apart. And where legalism says, I'm going to do this thing, do this endeavor, do this good work, so that I, I gain... Uh, merit with God and please God. Discipline says, I love God and I want to please him with my life. It's just a world of difference in motivation. One is self-centered. The other is God-centered. Uh, legalism is forbidden in scripture. The Apostle Paul hated legalism. He fought the Judaizers bare knuckle all the way across Asia Minor. But he's the same man who says, it doesn't make it a suggestion, it's a command. Discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness because it holds promise in this present life and in the life to come. This is a faithful saying, he says, discipline is worthy of all acceptance. So uh, Paul said it. And so we need to not c confuse those things. That discipline is, is a graced activity, whereas legalism is the opposite of grace. Yeah. That, that's that's really helpful, actually. And um, when you think about men in the United States of America or, or here in Ireland, I mean, what, what do you think are the real pressure points on men today? Uh, well, there's a lot of them. Uh, the, the one is, is that uh, the way culture is gone today, uh, a man... I'm talking about in general culture. I'm not talking about evangelical church culture, but the general culture is a man who asserts himself, a man who attempts to, to be manly in the full sense of the word is often uh, pushed down. He's considered to be a threat culturally. Uh, you know, our, our whole uh, culture is on the elevation of women, moving women ahead, breaking the glass ceiling and all that sort of thing and, and keeping men down. So a man who is assertive, a man who wants to take leadership is considered a threat and often 
in many contexts today. So that's one thing. Um, I think that uh, uh, I, th I think that the internet breeds indolence and a lack of assertiveness. Uh, you can just get lost on the internet uh, in your imagination, in your activities. So I think with young men, that's particularly a threat. And uh, and then 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 the confusion, where you will understand that. Uh, if you want to be uh, a great soccer player, football player, uh, that disciplines everything. I, I think of uh, Beckham, bend it like Beckham, going to a park at East London, taking a bunch of balls every day after school and working on that kick till he got that, what we call in America, knuckleball. It goes like this through the air and the goalie doesn't know where it's going. And, and, and Beckham himself said, he said, uh, he said, if you want a compliment, it, it was, it's work. It's work. It's work. Well, we understand that. Mm -hmm. But we somehow think that the spiritual life ought to just kind of flow out naturally. And if there's any discipline, that it's not really of the Holy Spirit because it's so existential and subjective. And that's absolute foolishness. Yeah. Yeah. That that's helpful again as well. Just thinking about that idea that we've got to work at this. Yeah. If we're, be, if we're going to be the true followers of Christ that He's called us to be, it doesn't just fall into our lap. It it, it takes effort, as in every other walk of life where you want to become skillful. And in the light of that, then what would you say? Where would you say we need to change as men? <laughs> that's a very yeah. broad question, but. But what are, what, are, what, are, what are you seeing amongst the men in churches that you go, as well as what you said, these, these, are, these are the areas where we need to change? The, the specific areas that, that we would need to change. I, I would say, uh, I, I mean, I'm not putting them in order because I've got a certain order in the book, but one of the things that I would say is, is that there needs to be a radical discipline of the mind. That the mind is like a computer, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, Paul says in uh, Philippians 4, 8, that he lists a series of eight things to think about. It says, think on these things, and it's command. So we're to think of, of those noble things, the things that are uplifting and high and so on and that it requires a discipline to do that. Well, the discipline is two-edged. There's the discipline of intake, for instance, the Holy Scriptures, listening to God's Word being preached, reading the Bible, studying it. I mean, the kind of intake that you want to have. But there's the discipline of rejection, the things that you don't put into your mind. Okay. And... Uh, uh, I like to say uh, on the positive thing that, that that what resides between our ears, the the uh, I think twelve billion neurons that dwell between our ears, about three or four pounds, um, is which is as complex as the universe itself, just the mind itself. Uh, that mind is capable of, like Einstein, of imagining time that bends. Uh, of, uh, of doing a, a Bach piece with all the counterpoint. It can do all, all of that uh, to receiving and sending messages to God, something that no computer can do, yeah. will ever be able to do. Yeah. So we, we've, got, we've got to discipline what, what goes into our mind. And so it also demands rejection. And so, this is this is pretty hard stuff on my part, but if you're a man who spends uh, and I'm uh, spends uh, well, the average time a television set is on in a, in a home. I'm just talking about TV. I'm not. I'm, I should be talking about the whole internet thing. But just that alone, you spend four hours a day listening to the news and watching things and so on. It's it's just a bunch of stuff coming in that. And then you spend 15 minutes a day, if that, reading scripture, guess what's going to happen? 
your mind is going to be dominated by the culture and by sometimes the filth that's out there and uh, and so on. So there's there's got to be a discipline of the mind, and it's, it it does demand saying no to certain things. If I'm talking to a millennial, it might be saying no to Xbox and a few other things where you spend your whole time in that universe and with no thought of God. So uh, you got to be, you got to do that. And then you need to fill your, your mind with the things of God. And uh, so when I talk like that, obviously I mean scripture to begin yeah. with. Yeah. And, I, and I would say that, that a man today, if he's got one of these, like I have it, yeah, has always got the scripture with him. Uh, I can I can listen to the scripture anytime I want anywhere. I can plug it into uh, earphones or buds and uh, run four miles and listen to the scripture. I can do it while I'm driving to a job. I can do it on the train. So uh, you can fill yourself with the Word of God. And then the other thing to do is to become a good listener. Um, now, I, I'm sure you have the same kind of. Uh, I, I do the, the your sports commentators do the same thing, it, uh, but like American football, if I'm watching say Monday Night Football and I see a play that takes place and I go, "What happened?" I, I, all of a sudden, and the ball's out there, and then the commentator slows the whole thing down and explains what the tackle did and the guard did and where the quarterback looked, and what this guy ran around, this guy, this one. And I go, Oh, that's what happened. Well, yeah. I like to think that when you listen to the preaching of the word on the Lord's day, it's like slowing it down. And the preacher is taking you working your way through a text. And as you're really listening, taking notes, you're going, Oh, I see. Yeah. That's how it works. So if you if you're filling yourself with God's word, you're listening and then perhaps involved in individual study. I haven't even mentioned books yet. Uh, you can become a man of the word, whether you are a plumber or a surgeon. You can be filled with God's word. And it, it's just as difficult for a surgeon to be filled with God's word as a plumber because everybody's busy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, but we, we have the technology here. Or if I meditate on Scripture, I'll say take uh, Philippians three ten that I might know Him, the power of the resurrection, the fellowship of sufferings, being conformed to His death. And I can I can have it on my phone as a note. I can tap on it, think about it. I mean, so technology I think, I think, yeah, is allowing us. Don't often think about the discipline of listening and how important that is. It's and we live in a very restless, distracted world, don't we? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, here I am talking about reading scripture, and I haven't talked about memorizing or med meditation, but those kinds of things. But uh, but when you look, when you read the scriptures, you don't very often where say where it says you can read about the Bereans who studied the word, but it doesn't say read the word, read the word, read the word. It says listen. Listen, yeah. listen, hear the word of the Lord repeatedly.
Evening everyone, uh, my name is Steve Auld uh, from the Great Victoria Street Church and I've been asked to lead us in prayer along with Stephen Wilson from the Letter Kenny Church. Uh, so we've been thinking there about being filled in our hearts and minds with the Lord and his truth and so I'm going to pray first a general prayer using the words of Ephesians chapter 3. So let's pray together. Father, together we bow before you, our Father. And it's from you that every family in heaven and on earth is named. We pray, Father, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant us to be strengthened as men with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Father, we ask that you would root us as men and ground us in your love. May we have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled together with all the fullness of God. Father, as men in our churches, Fill us with your fullness. Mm -hmm. Help us to be godly. Help us to be faithful, humble servants, leaders, shepherds, servants in every way that you've called us to. We ask for you to raise up a generation of godly men right across our churches who would just radically set a tone of godliness to the glory of your name. Mm -hmm. Now to you who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to your power at work within us, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. As we continue on to pray together, our Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have tonight just to draw aside and to come and to come to pray to you. The opportunity just to, to reset as men, to, to focus and to wait upon you. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. I pray for each, each man here tonight, for each home and for each family that is represented. And I just think especially tonight of those who are married. I bring them before you tonight, Father, and I pray once more that that you would indeed guard each one's heart and mind, that you would protect each one. Oh Lord, we come and as we ask for your help, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be good husbands, uh, that you would just give us a heart of sacrificial love for our wives, help, to, help us to support them well, and help us to encourage them and to pray over them. Oh, Father, I also just think of these difficult times when when many have lost their jobs, those may be furloughing at the minute uh, from their work over the last number of months. I pray, the Lord, that you would encourage each one this evening. I pray, Lord, that there will be good news just around the corner at this time. Oh God, with the, just with the present pressures of this time of year, finances can be difficult. Finances can be tight. Making ends meet can be really difficult and hard. So I pray, Lord, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you, that we would trust in the one who is called our Jehovah Jireh, the one who will provide. So Lord, help us now this evening as we continue on together, that we would be men with disciplined minds. Help us to be strong and courageous in the places where you've put us. And thank you so much, O oh Lord, for your wonderful, sustaining, saving grace that we have in your son. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kent, for picking this up again. We've, we have yeah. had a few technical challenges along the way with this recording, but what you said so far has been so helpful. I just wanted to pick up about this whole idea of the discipline of listening and how, as men, we're not really good at that and how important it is not only to listen to sermons yeah. from the pastor or the preacher, but also just to listen to God and listen to what, you know, our families are saying to us, that whole idea of listening. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Uh, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me say that from a preaching point of view, 
preaching is much more difficult today than it was 100 years ago. Yeah, or you know, maybe 120 years ago, because before uh, the wireless, before the telegraph and everything else, uh, it, was, it was the most exciting thing socially and intellectually in virtually every town because people didn't have all the flood of media coming in on them all the time. Now, people are flooded with billions of words. And not only that, they, because, because of attention spans, the people in the media have learned to, to give you five seconds here, 10 seconds here, and so on. So people, and it's all visually stimulated. Well, preaching by nature is not visually st stimulating, and it is a logical train of thought taken from the scriptures or whatever your homiletic outline is. Well, that's not the way discourse is on, on the media today. It is disjointed, it's full of stimulation. And so somebody that's sitting there on the Lord's day has to focus on listening. It's really important to do that and find that to be a very difficult thing to do. I, I see it, I see it in my congregation. And oftentimes it's the only time people have slowed down to sit down and listen. So listening is is a discipline which we all have to work on. I, I work, have to work on it myself, like take notes, uh, follow along in the Bible, uh, decide what I'm gonna uh, get when I, uh, you know, when I when I leave the church. So that that's one of the things. The other thing is is about spirituality today. Uh, you can see by my age. I was a young I was a young man in high school in 1950s. Uh, pornography uh, was not readily available. I remember Play, Playboy magazine came out, and that was a big deal during the 50s. But today, the screen that I have in front of me, if all I do is press the wrong button, I can I can see things that are totally addicting, and men today are are assaulted. Uh, by it's it's a pornographic world promising yeah. a pornotopia of pleasure, yeah. and uh, so it is. I think it's more challenging today to keep a mind that's centered upon God yeah. than it was in past years. Yes. Yeah, I, I think for men we could talk about that for a long, long time. That whole challenge on on the pornographic issue. Yeah. And I I I just wanted to kind of come towards a conclusion here by by. I know your grandchildren are walking around behind you there, which is great. Yeah. We can see yeah. we see some life there in the hope. But, yeah. Yeah. but uh, you wrote The Disciplines of a Godly Man nearly 30 years ago, I believe, 1991. Yeah. Would you say, Kent, it's, it's more difficult for men to be godly now than then? I, th I think it is. I, I think human nature hasn't changed. I mean, we are sinners. And... Uh, if we, if our life isn't filled with Christ, uh, there's always room for deprovement, as R.C. Sproul once said. Uh, so I think I think it is more difficult, and it requires I think it requires the kind of discipline I'm talking about. It requires I think uh, some a level of accountability with other men that understand the serpentine ways of a man's heart. I think that that's very helpful. Um, it, I think if you're married, I think that that kind of um, working together because your wife realizes you're a man uh, and uh, prays for you, have, have the one who loves you the most pray for you, pray together about a purity of mind. But, but, but the whole thing, I mean, yeah. uh, there's, there's so many things that are involved in, in, uh, in necessary disciplines. I've got 18 of them in the book here. <laughs> Yeah, um, that, that's brilliant. I mean, a lot of what you said tonight has been really helpful, really insightful. Put a few little nuggets of, of, of things in there that, that's helpful for us. I yeah. suppose just to finish off, Kent, if, if I could put it like this, this pandemic will one day come to an end. And yeah. our desire, I think, is that as men, we are better men. We're better able to lead our families. And Above all, that we're better able to lead our churches because the church here in Ireland is crying out for men to step up into that leadership position. Uh, yeah. So I guess my last question to you before we sign off is just to say, 
how do you think in the light of all you've said we can emerge from this pandemic as better man well i've uh, i read some secular articles in uh, the wall street journal here in the states and they have they'll have articles about non-christian families um enriching themselves during the pandemic so they're they're playing games together that they haven't played uh they're having more conversations together that they haven't had uh family times and that sort of thing so the secular culture there are people talking about piggybacking the pandemic to higher spiritual levels and i certainly think with uh life slowing down if you're a family man the 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 the, the the demands of your children in school have, have really shrunken. Uh, it's an opportunity to spend more time with the family in a healthy uh, engagement, uh, enjoying one another. It's an opportunity to read together, read Christian books to your children. It's an opportunity to pray together. It's an opportunity to, to focus your mind on, on good preaching listen to sermons together from your pastor and perhaps others. Uh, you know, I've got a list of, uh, of books in the back of Disciplines of Godly Man that I called from a number of prominent Christians as to what their most important and helpful books are. So, for instance, I've got J.I. Packer's favorites in the back of the book. And, yeah. uh, Dick and Lucas, so 30, 30 years old and you'd still encourage us to read those books, yeah? I would. So many of them are timeless. So uh, it's 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 an opportunity for enrichment if you if you will say I'm going to use it for that. Okay. Yeah. And require some discipline. There's Sitting down with your spouse. Not yeah. that word again. Yeah. 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 Well, Ken, listen. Exactly. I, I I'm going to bring this to a close right now. I'm so grateful for you giving your time and your insights to us tonight as men of the Baptist churches in our association. Uh, we desperately need to hear what you've had to say tonight. Oh. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your reality. Thank you for persevering through the technical challenges that we've had. Yeah. Thank you for uh, allowing us a little insight into what it means to be godly men. So can I just on behalf of all of us say, thank you so much and the Lord bless you and Barbara. We are so sorry that we didn't get the chance to hear you preach in our uh in our anniversary service in october uh maybe some other time in the future that will happen well, i don't know yeah well thank you it's been a great privilege and uh hope you have a wonderful fall and uh advent season as we celebrate the incarnation of our lord thanks ken god bless you thank you bye now
Good evening, everyone. My name is Davy Ellison. Um, and if you were to speak to people who know me, uh, to my friends and to my family and ask them uh, what do they think of whenever they uh, hear my name, uh, the answers would include some of the following. Uh, the Irish Baptist College, obviously. Um, white chocolate. Uh, Nambari tea uh, and lots of it. Football, Manchester United in particular. Uh, the Simpsons. Uh, and as you can see behind me, reading. Uh, I, I love reading, absolutely love reading. Uh, and recently I read R. Kent Hughes' book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man, for the very first time. Uh, and I think it can rightly be called uh, a modern classic. It's one of the most helpful books I've read in a very long time. Perhaps the primary reason why it is uh, such a beneficial book is because it's hugely challenging, yet it does not crush the reader. Too many books either burden the reader with undue expectation or inspire the reader with empty feel-good platitudes. And as we've just heard from R. Kent Hughes, he does neither of those, and he does neither of those in this book. He challenges us without crushing us. Now, Hughes doesn't miss in his book. He hits us right between the eyes. He challenges us with the big things of life, our relationships, our marriages, and our families our soul and character and what goes on inside, our, our ministry in the context of the local church. Hughes asks the reader directly, how are you faring in all of these areas of your life? He challenges us. But the book doesn't crush us. Why? Well, first, Hughes writes with honest humility. We have seen it already in that interview. Uh, now, the book isn't a book of confessions, but the reader gets the feeling that Hughes has failed to some degree in all of these disciplines at one time or another. In other words, the author is in the battle with the reader. He's not writing from some higher plane or some position of victory. He's in the battle with us, and he's shoulder to shoulder with us. That is encouraging. Second, all of the remedies and steps suggested by Hughes for implementing these disciplines are intensely practical and in the end, really rather simple. He makes it seem achievable. More, he consistently, consistently links all of these uh, disciplines to God's grace in Jesus Christ uh, and the power and work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Perhaps it would be helpful for me just to outline briefly a few of the changes in my life um, that are a result of reading this book. They are small, uh, but I hope over time uh, that God will use them to continue to shape me. First thing that's changed is there's been a renewed focus and activity in my prayer life. I love praying with God's people. I struggle to do it consistently and faithfully when I'm on my own. Uh, this book, Ken Hughes' book, pointed me to the Prayer Mate app, um, which I've been using on my phone. He's talked about technology, uh, and I'm now using that every morning to help focus my prayers, to aid me in my prayer life. I find it very, very helpful. Uh, another change that's come about is my confidence in the benefit of disciplines or holy habits. Uh, my confidence in that has been renewed. Uh, there's a constant danger that we make things such as Bible reading, prayer, cultivation of character, attendance and service in church, and a host of other good things. We make them laws to live by. Uh, and then because they're laws, well, we're afraid of legalism, and so we reject them outright. But the vision set forth by Ken Hughes in this book is one which has renewed my confidence that these habits are good. More, they're actually godly. Another area that has been changed and challenged is my pride. Um, Christians can often fall into the trap that they think they're doing okay uh, just because we do not do certain things. But Hughes warns in the book, heart attitude is the key factor. It's not just about externals, but it's also internals. It's not just about actions, but it's also about character, purity, integrity, the use of the tongue, diligence and work living a life of worship. Externally, we may seem to be doing all of the right things, but the question is, have we taken our thoughts captive to the word of Christ? Is our heart attitude in these things godly? Has there been a change of character and not just externals?
This has been a huge challenge for me to work through and something I'll continue to work through. As I finish, I, I want to commend this book to you. Uh, I'm convinced that a careful reading of it will continue to bear fruit in the Christian man's life for many subsequent years. More, it will not only challenge you, but encourage you in the battle for godliness. This very difficult year has taught us many different things. Most notably, it's told us to treasure what is truly important. Uh, and what scripture teaches us is that a godly character is truly important. I want to commend Hugh's book to you and I want to encourage you to purchase it and to read it because it's a book that will help you as you strive towards godliness. As we think about the disciplines of a godly man, take the next couple of minutes to reflect on the two questions on the screen. Thank you. Well, just as we move towards the end of our time here this evening, I just want to drop one verse into your, your mind and into your thoughts this evening. Just, just a little uh, devotional for you to take away at the end of, of this session that we've had uh, together. There it is on your screen in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Brothers, be not children in understanding. However, in malice be you children but in understanding be men. Marvellous. Why don't you just, even where you're sitting right now, speak that out. Brothers, be not children in understanding. However, in malice be you children, but in understanding be men. Obviously, the, the context of this verse is Paul's teaching in tongues and spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but there's a wider principle here and the principle is about the type of people we are to be. Paul makes it very clear that when it comes to evil or the dark side of life or malice, we are to be like little children. We are to be childlike, just in the same way as there are, there are things you would never expose your children to. You would not want them to see or hear or be a part of. The Apostle Paul here is laying down that principle that actually there are there are things that we just need to be childlike about. There are things we ought not to see or know about or think about or let into our minds. Because in malice, he says, or with regards to evil, 
be like the children. Then he says, but in understanding, be men. How important that is. He wants us to be real men. He wants us to be mature men. That's the word there that's, that's used in your, in your thinking, in your mind, in your understanding. Be real men. Can I put it like this? The Apostle Paul is saying, grow up when it comes to important things. Be real men when it comes to important issues of life and understanding. Be men. God's challenging us as men to think theologically and to filter everything that we think about from the understanding of who God is and the understanding of who we are and the understanding of his world. And when we think right about God and we think right about ourselves and we think right about the world, then we're starting to align ourselves with God's purposes. We're starting to be men in our understanding. There's such a challenge on us in these days to be men. And why is it that in most churches, pastors struggle to find the next generation of deacons or the next level of elders? It's because sometimes men are just taken up with trifles and with childish things. And Matthew Henry wrote these words a long time ago, uh, wonderful words, and they sound so up to date. Matthew Henry wrote this in his commentary on this verse. Children are apt to be struck with novelty and strange appearances. Do not act like them and prefer noise and show to worth and substance. Now, does not that sound like it was written yesterday? Do not act like them and prefer noise and show to worth and substance. Men, it's time to get serious about God. It's time to think theologically. We also got to think with a gospel focus. This is about this has got to take everything of our lives. We as we emerge from this pandemic, as we go beyond this pandemic, we want to be men of courage, men of faith, men who lead our families well. Man, maybe it's a long time since you prayed with your wife. Maybe it's a long time since you prayed with your children. Have you abdicated that responsibility to your children? Maybe it's a long time since you sat around the dinner table and talked about things of substance and things of worth. Talked about the gospel and allowed yourself to be gospel focused at the dinner table. Sitting with your children, watching the football or going for a walk. Be gospel focused. The Apostle Paul says there's certain things we've got to be childish about. But when it comes to understanding, we've got to be men. I became a Christian at 17. And uh, very soon I, I heard the, the, little, the little piece of poetry that I'm sure that you've heard. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It was said, I believe, by C.T. Studd. I have that on my office desk. It reminds me every day to be gospel focused. One life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And then I went to a youth group uh, not long after I got converted and we sang a, a song. I haven't heard it for years, but it went like this. Is he satisfied? Is he satisfied? Is he satisfied with me? Have I done my best? Have I? stood the test am i all that i could be is he satisfied with me and as i was reflecting on that i was reflecting on my life as a christian over what's now over 40 years since i trusted christ at 17 and i said lord you've been so gracious to me you have been so generous to me you have been so so compassionate to me you have overlooked my faults you've shown me grace upon grace upon grace lord what can i do for you what else can i do but give you my life and i want to leave you with with a, a short story of a man that you may or may not have heard of his name was william borden he was a millionaire born into a massively wealthy family he became a follower of jesus on his 18th birthday his father sent him on a world tour as a birthday present because his father could afford it. 
And actually, as Borden traveled around the world, he was struck at 18 years of age by the spiritual needs of the world. In fact, he was struck particularly for China. After he became a Christian and got concerned for the work, mission fields of the world, he, he wrote in the inside leaf of his Bible, no reserve, no reserve. When he shared with his father and his family that he was thinking about serving the Lord uh, in China, his father caught him out of the family business, caught him out of the family fortune. And Borden opened his Bible and wrote, underneath no reserve, he wrote these words, no retreat, no retreat. He prepared to go to China to serve as a missionary. He only got as far as Egypt when he got really sick. And he died in Egypt, never having made it to China. Two days before he died, he wrote in his Bible, under no reserve, no retreat, he wrote these words, no regrets, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. He died on the 9th of April, 1813. 1913, I beg your pardon. 1913, he was born in 1887. He was just 26 years of age when he died. No reserve, no retreat, and no regrets. Listen, it's been lovely to share this evening with you. So thankful for the men who have taken part. I want to ask you just to stay for a few more minutes before you go into the rest of your evening and just take this time to listen to this worship song and worship God right where you are. Worship is not just a Sunday activity. It's an activity for your, for your living room, for your home. And just before you rush off into the rest of the evening, just take a moment to, to worship as we listen to this song. And then I'm just going to come back in and close off our evening. God bless you, man. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus lay
Well, thank you very much, men, for joining us tonight. We've had a great night together. I hope you've really found it useful. I want to say a really big thank you to those men who have uh, taken part along with me uh, tonight, Johnny Ward, uh, Aaron Davis, uh, and John Gibson. Thank you to Steve Ald from Great Victoria Street Church, Stephen Wilson from Letter County Church. Thank you to Davy Ellison, our training director. Thank you for, uh, for their contribution tonight. I just want to say to you, man, that if you have any uh, questions or thoughts on this evening, please do let us know that. We would love to know what your feedback is. Perhaps it's something we might try on another occasion. Our hope and prayer for this was to both encourage and challenge. And I hope that that has happened. A special thank you tonight to Nigel over there in the Baptist Centre, who has run all the technicals tonight for us. And I think it's been an incredibly uh, powerful and hopefully really, really beneficial evening. So God bless you as you go. Keep serving well and keep honouring our Lord and keep being the man of God that God is calling us to do in understanding. Be man, says Paul. Let me just pray for us. Father, thank you for the men who've been gathered online this evening. And I pray our gracious God and Father that you will just part us with your blessing now. May the grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit be our portion this night and evermore. Amen. Nigel, you go, Nigel, thank you so much. Uh, well done, everyone. That was great. How did you feel that went, guys? 